Hello and welcome to Prism of the Past, a weekly series about historical events, people, and situations from the fascinating to the forgotten. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're gonna be talking about the Cathars, a religious sect that was actually entirely wiped out by the Catholic Church. Now, as always with incredibly religious topics, I'm going to put a disclaimer right here that you can feel free to believe what you want or whatever you don't wanna believe, that's cool too. I'm not here to attack your religious beliefs and quite frankly, I don't really care what you do or don't believe in. What I do like to look into is interesting historical facts and this is one of the things we're gonna look into because this historically happened. So do what you want. If you cannot separate history from religion, this probably just isn't even the channel or the podcast for you. So I'm just gonna be real frank with that. So with all of that being said, let's jump right into today's episode. But before we do that really quick, I just wanna say this, it's kind of awkward for me because I really hate doing this, but many of you have asked me how to connect with me outside of these topics. I've received many emails and stuff like that, and I just don't really tend to check my emails. So I feel really bad because I just leave emails unanswered. If you wanna connect with me outside of these episodes and you want to make suggestions on future topics or anything like that, click on my Linktree link in my description box or if you're in the podcast format, it's like a little pop-up sidebar or something like that, it's gonna be a Linktree link. And it's gonna have a nice, easy, organized list of all of my social media from my Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, Discord server, you name it, all of those things are going to be there. And in my Discord server, I even have like a little suggestion area where you can suggest video topics and stuff like that too. So I just wanna put that out there because apparently many of you have wanted to suggest topics to me. I never get to emails on time and then I feel really bad. So I just don't answer anything because then I just feel really bad that it's been like weeks. So instead of that, just like message me on Twitter, put something in the suggestion area in Discord. I'm just letting you guys know. So now with that really awkward thing out of the way, now let's talk about today's episode. Cathars, also known as Cathari from the Greek for pure ones, were a dualist medieval religious sect of Southern France. Almost everything known about the Cathars has been taken from confessions around the time of the Crusades, otherwise known as the Cathar Crusade. So I'm not going to say that there's no truth to any of these confessions, simply that we do have to be a little bit skeptical about some of the information and beliefs that we'll be looking at today, since it's not as if the Cathars are around to actually set the record straight. And you know, history is written by the victor, not the loser. According to my sources, Cathars were also known as Albigensians for the town Albi, a strong center of Cathar belief. Cathar priests lived simply, had no possessions, imposed no taxes or penalties, and regarded men and women as equals, aspects of the faith which appealed to many at the time disillusioned from the church. Cathars believed that Satan had tricked a number of angels into falling from heaven and then encased them in bodies. The purpose of life was to renounce the pleasures and enticements of the world and through repeated incarnations, make one's way back to heaven. There was a strict hierarchy among the Cathars. The perfecti were those who had renounced the world, priests and bishops. The credentes were those who were still interacting with the world, but worked towards renunciation. And then the sympathizers, non-believers who aided and supported Cathar communities. It's also been said that the Cathars not only rejected the teachings of the Catholic Church as immoral, but said that most of the books of the Bible were inspired by Satan himself. They criticized the church for hypocrisy, greed, lechery of its clergy, and the church's acquisition of land and wealth. A few more of their beliefs include vegetarianism, though fish was allowed to credentes and sympathizers, that suicide was a rational and dignified response under certain conditions, the dignity of manual labor, and celibacy for the perfecti. Apparently, they just discouraged marriage among the perfecti in general. Cather.info goes into great detail about their beliefs if you're interested, but I'm just gonna go through a few of the highlights. This source said that they also did believe in reincarnation and heaven, but not in hell as it is normally conceived by many mainstream Christians. According to later Cather ideas, when we die, the powers of the air throng around and persecute the newly released soul, which flees into the first lodging of clay that it finds. This lodging of clay might be human or animal. The soul would therefore be condemned to a cycle of rebirth, trapped in another physical body. By leading a good life, human beings, or rather their souls, could win freedom from imprisonment and return to heaven, the immaterial realm of the good God. For members of the elect, those who had undertaken the consolamentum, a spiritual baptism, death was no more than taking off a dirty tunic. The Cathar view was that their theology was older than that of the Roman church and that the Roman church had corrupted its own scripture, invented new doctrine and abandoned its beliefs and practices of the early church. 
The Catholic view, of course, was exactly the opposite. They imagined Catholicism to be a badly distorted version of Catholicism. They were dualists, and that is to say they believed in two universal principles, a good God and a bad God. Dualist ideas have a long history stretching into pre-Christian times and studied by Greek philosophers such as Plato. I tried to figure out when exactly Cathars began and exactly what era they originated from, but from what I can tell, they evolved and spread from the Bogomils in the 10th century. The Bogomils of Bosnia have been called the forgotten Gnostics in some articles, and they, like the Cathars, were denounced as heretics. Unlike the Cathars, however, they endured and in later years adopted Islam during the Ottoman rule. Cathars were also Universalists and Gnostics, which means they also believed in the ultimate salvation of all human beings, but also that divine knowledge is granted only to an inner elite. Here is an account of how they saw themselves. Of themselves, they say, we are the poor of Christ who have no fixed abode and flee from city to city like sheep amidst wolves, are persecuted as were the apostles and the martyrs, despite the fact that we lead a most strict and holy life, preserving day and night in facts, in abstinence, in prayers and in labor from which we only seek the necessities of life. We undergo this because we are not of this world, but you lovers of the world have peace with it because you are of this world. False apostles who pollute the word of Christ, who seek after their own interest, have led you and your fathers astray from the true path. We and our fathers, the apolistic descent, have continued in the grace of God and shall so remain to the end of time. To distinguish between us and you Christ said, by their fruits you shall know them. Our fruits consist in following the footsteps of Christ. Again, many believe that this derived from the Persian religion called Manichaeism, I believe, and that's a Gnostic dualistic religious movement founded in Persia in the third century. Though this religion was long considered a Christian heresy, it was a religion in its own right. According to Britannica, because of the coherence of its doctrines and rigidness of its structure and institutions, preserved throughout its history a unity and unique character. The point of this is simply to say that these beliefs weren't exactly widely accepted at the time. If it wasn't Christian, it was heresy in some way. Catholic theologians have debated for years if Cathars were Christian heretics or not Christian at all. Roman Catholics still refer to Cathar beliefs as the great heresy, and the official Catholic position is that Catharism isn't Christian at all. The Christian History Institute explains this stance by stating the following. Although the Cathars claimed to base their teachings exclusively on the New Testament, their basic creed was unusual. God is very good. In this world, nothing is good. It therefore follows that God did not make anything that is in this world. Cathars believed the material universe was created by an evil power, which had imprisoned angelic souls in physical bodies and condemned them to a perpetual round of reincarnation. The good God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to rescue the imprisoned souls. But since matter is evil, Jesus was a spiritual being who had only the appearance of a body. Therefore, he could not have died on the cross and risen again. In the Cathar view, Christ redeemed humankind by founding the Cathar Church, to which he gave the Holy Scriptures and a single sacrament, the consoling. It supposedly conferred the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands and was modeled on Catholic confirmation and of Acts 8.14-17. It was administered only to adults who had undergone a prolonged period of instruction and it involved a complete change of life. Those who perceived it were known as the perfect. Obviously, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ dying on the cross and coming back after three days, well, then calling yourself a Christian wasn't exactly going to make much sense. And that's pretty much a massive part of Christianity. It seems more like the Cathars did believe in some teachings of the Bible, but not all. They were doing their own thing, like, hey, you know, as long as we're not hurting anyone, you know, believe what you want, mainstream or not, we're just gonna vibe and do our own thing in our own lane. Yet, whether or not you may think they're heretics, the religion did flourish around the Mediterranean Sea. According to my sources, the general Southern Med area was known for its high culture, tolerance, and liberalism. Catharism thrived and grew there. Some Catholic texts even referred to the danger of it replacing Catholicism completely as Catharism was supported or at least tolerated among the nobility and common people. It didn't take long after their inception for the Cathari to be contemned, however. At a council held in 1022 at Orleans in the present of King Robus the Pious, 13 Cathari were condemned to be burned. 10 of these were canons of the Church of the Holy Cross and another was said to be the confessor to Queen Constance. 
In 1114, several heretics were captured and seized and burned again. Seven more were burned in 1176, and towards the end of the century, the Count of Flanders, Philip I, was known for his severity towards them. The burnings happened in other countries too, for the record, not just France, but in Italy, Germany, England, throughout Europe, all various kingdoms, according to my source. Upper Italy was, after Southern France, the principal seat of the heresy. Between 1030 and 1040, an important Catharist community was discovered at the castle of Monteforte near Asti in Piedmont. Some of the members were seized by the Bishop of Asti and a number of noblemen of the neighborhood, and on their refusal to retract, were burned. Catharism was comparatively unimportant in Germany and England. In Germany, it appeared principally in the Rhinelands. Some members were apprehended in 1052 at Goslar in Hanover and hanged by order of the emperor, Henry III. About 1,110 some heretics, probably Cathary, among them two priests appeared at Trier, but do not seem to have been subjected to any penalty. This was around 400 years before Martin Luther's 95 theses sparked the Protestant movement and changed religion as it was known in the 1500s, just to give you a sense of the time period we are in right now. Europe was completely Roman Catholic, essentially. According to one source, there were other religions extant in Europe at the time, Judaism and Islam, but there were no state religions anywhere but in the Moorish enclave of Granada in Southern Spain, which was the only place that another religion held sway and was entrenched politically. So the sovereign and sovereign power was closely identified with Roman Catholicism and the maintenance of Roman Catholicism. A heretical movement, therefore, in seeking to undermine Roman Catholicism would also be seen as a direct threat to the state. The Pope was a secular ruler with about a third of Italy under his direct control around this time. Heresy at this time was easily equated with treason, a betrayal of government and state. As there was no separation of church and state at that time, noblemen that tolerated or sympathized with the Cathars were excommunicated, one of these being Raymond VI, Count of Toulouse. Other earlier sympathizers had also been identified, such as Eleanor of Aquitaine and her daughter. The Cathar ideals were spreading and, as Catholics of the time believed, threatening to change the government. It's said that the Catholics spread propaganda about the Cathars and heretics around, making accusations of black magic, worshiping Satan, consorting with demons, and things of that nature. One source reads, an example of the contrast between propaganda and truth is provided by the disparity between alleged and real attitudes to sex. According to Catholic propaganda, Cathars, including parfaits and parfaitees, habitually engaged in sexual excesses, including regular orgies. At the same time as propagating these detecting heretics was not by their sexual excesses, but by their sexual purity. We have a striking example from the 12th century in the Archdiocese of Rheims, where a group of heretics were discovered through the refusal of a young girl to submit to the attentions of a clergyman. The refusal of a girl to submit to a clergyman's sexual demands appears to have been so unusual that she was questioned and admitted that she believed she had an obligation to keep her virginity. As a result, she and her friends were investigated more closely and soon a nest of heretical believers was exposed. The heretics were described by the Archbishop Samson, who asserted that heresy was being spread by interrent weavers who encouraged sexual promiscuity. The Catholics claimed that the Cathars practiced incest bestiality and perverted the natural order. They claimed that the Cathars taught that Jesus and Mary Magdalene had a sexual relationship, like you get the idea here. Some of it was twisting words and beliefs, others are just blatantly untrue. Even with all of this though, the Cathars didn't seem to be going anywhere. There would always be dissenters and Cathars especially were a threat. Given this, they had to act and thus came the crusade. The Albigensian Crusade took place from 1209 to 1229 CE and some sources claim it was the first crusade to specifically target heretic Christians. This crusade called by Pope Innocent III and one hell of a name for someone who's calling a crusade, right? Well, the Pope allegedly sent preachers first to convert the Cathars and he was actually killed in January 1208. So he stopped trying to reason with them and went straight to crusade mode apparently. Other sources say that the crusade just began in 1208, but the first major siege that took place was in 1209. This siege was on the castle of Beziers. My source reads, on the 22nd of July, 1209, the crusader army arrived on the periphery of the area of the Languedoc where Cathars flourished. There were believed to be around 200 Cathar parfaits in the town among a much greater population of sympathetic Catholics. 
The townspeople, believing their walls impregnable, were careless, and the town was overrun while the leading crusader churchmen and nobles were still planning their siege. Today, nothing remains of the Viscount's castle, but the town still bears scars inflicted by the crusaders. It was here that the abbot commander gave the famous comment, kill them all, the Lord will recognize his own. According to Britannica, 20,000 people were killed at this siege. A different source, worldhistory.org, claims that the first major action was taken on July 21st, not 22nd, and 10,000 people were killed, not 20,000. Either way, it's still many thousands that were killed, and it was regarded as particularly cold-blooded and brutal when you consider that it's estimated the city had only 700 heretics in the walls at that time. The majority people the Crusaders killed here were likely completely innocent and Catholic. It became clear that this was no longer a campaign of conversion, but conquest. People were so alarmed by this brutality that some didn't even want to fight the armies. Such was the shock of the massacre that the city of Narbonne surrendered immediately and locals fled any castles and towns likely to be the next target of a Crusader attack. Another source reads, some gave up without a fight, the desired result of the Crusaders' deliberate terror tactics. Another castle, Carcassonne, was besieged from August 5th to 15th of that same year. It was restored in 1853, and you can actually visit the medieval city this day, by the way. Yet in the 1100s and 1200s, this was a center for Cathars. The Crusaders, reportedly 10,000 men strong, marched here after slaughtering those at Viziers. However, though this was more fortified, the castle was quite some distance away from the River Odd and dependent for water on deep wells within the walls. The Crusaders cut off their access to the river and in early August offered Raymond Roger 10 cavil, not the excommuted sympathizer we mentioned earlier, but a different Raymond. They said they would allow him and 11 companions to leave unharmed if he surrendered and Raymond refused. Morale in the city ebbed away as the walls were drying up in the summer heat, but the Crusaders didn't want to destroy everything as they had in Beziers because well, then they wouldn't have any people left to rule over. My source states, they offered fresh terms. If the city surrendered, the lives of the inhabitants would be spared, provided they walked out wearing nothing but their shirts and breeches, leaving everything else for the Crusaders. On August 14th, Raymond Roger and nine of his subordinates were given safe conduct to discuss the terms with the besiegers and accepted them. But then in breach of the safe conduct, Raymond Rogers was seized and chained up. He died in mysterious circumstances in his own prison a few weeks later, aged 24. The next day, the city surrendered and the citizens left as agreed, carrying nothing but their sins, in the words of the Crusades accompanying Chronicler. So sorry to get a little bit confusing here, but there's Raymond Roger of Trencavel, then Raymond VI, Count of Toulouse. The former is out of the picture. He died, as we just said, but the latter, Raymond VI, remained an enemy of the Crusaders, though we will get to him in just a moment. The Chateau de Termes fell to Simon de Montfort after a siege lasting four months from August to November 1210. Just from looking at it, you can probably tell this would have been a difficult battle because it's situated on top of a massive hill defended on three sides by ravines. One book, The Song of the Cathar Wars, describes how this was done and reads, Nine months, actually from late July to 22nd of November 1210, the army sat around that stronghold until its water supply dried up. They had wine for another two or three months, but I do not think anyone can live without water. Then, God and the faith help me, there was a heavy downpour of rain which caused a great flood, and this led to their defeat. They put quantities of this rain water into butts and barrels and used it to knead and cook with. So violent a dysentery seized them, and the sufferers could not tell where they were. They all agreed to flee away rather than die like this unconfessed. They put the ladies of the castle up into the keep and then when it was dark night and no one could see what was happening, they went out, taking with them no possessions, nothing I believe except money. At that point, Raymond of Termes told them to wait because he was going to go back into the castle. And while they waited, some Frenchmen met him on his way in and they captured him and took him into the Count de Montfort. Let me interrupt here really quick to say, yes, this is a third Raymond, an entirely separate guy. I swear to God, this, it must've been around this time Raymond was like the name, like that was the rage. The others, Catalans and Angranese, fled to escape being killed. But the Count de Montfort behaved very well and took nothing from the ladies, not even the value of a penny coin. When it was known throughout the land that Termes had fallen, all of the strongest castles were abandoned. Men of these garrisons who left the castle never supposed that the Crusaders would get that far. God, who was full of mercy, worked a great miracle, for he gave finer winter weather than anyone had known in summer. I return to my subject, which I have left too long. 
to the Crusaders, it was a sign that God was on their side when they defeated Termes. They truly believed in their cause that what they were doing was God's work by burning alive those that refused to recant and convert. So many villages were completely destroyed by their acts, but this crusade was far from over. 1211 was a massive year for the Crusaders as Simon captured Lavoir, another Cathar stronghold. The head of the garrison was hanged along with his knights and his widowed sister was brutally murdered. One source says this was done by throwing her into a well. Up to 400 Cathars were burned to death too. Raymond Toulouse was the figurehead of the enemy in propaganda terms for some time, and though he had tried to negotiate with the Pope, he decided the Crusaders were making too many demands on his land, so he went independent once more. The siege of Toulouse became a particularly interesting and noteworthy one. The city was repeatedly besieged apparently, as Simon Montfort attacked in June 1211. After defeating a Toulouse Foy army at Castle in Aldry in September 1211 CE, de Montfort captured large areas of the south in 1212 CE. Raymond temporarily fled to England. Although Northern France was instigating plans of government in the region, by 1213 CE, guerrilla warfare had spread everywhere in the South. The massacres, burnings, and mutilations continued whenever a town or castle was captured. As consequence, the Pope canceled the crusade status of the campaign, but it would be given again, albeit sporadically, over the next 15 years. One source states, by 1229 CE, the official crusade was over, but the Cathars were still persecuted and Northern armies continued to sack villages and murder innocent people. Between May of 1243 and March of 1244, the Cathar stronghold of Montsegur had held against siege, but was finally taken and the last Cathar defense fell. In the massacre, which followed 200 perfecti were burned alive on a large pyre. This stronghold has perhaps become one of the most well-known of all Cathar castles, as it was supposedly where the last of the Cathars were burned to death. The ruin is open to the public, as is a museum in a nearby village. This castle is even said to have once held the Holy Grail, so it's famous for a few reasons, it seems. And this is where, according to many accounts, the story of the Cathars end. The last remaining Cathars were burned to death at Montsegur after refusing to renounce their faith. It's been referred to as a genocide that, quote, ushered in the machinery of the first modern police state, laying the groundwork for the Spanish Inquisition and for later inquisitions and genocides, end quote. Yet despite all of this, some say that the Cathars never actually existed. The thing is, we have mountains and mountains of proof to shut down Holocaust deniers. And frankly, I have no respect for whoever denies the Holocaust even happened, which is disgusting, beyond offensive and dangerously ignorant. To pretend a genocide never happened only disrespects those who have been victimized by it. However, in recent years, some articles, such as one from the LA Times in 2018, claim that there are those who don't believe there's any evidence the Cathars existed in the way history says. Their article states, for their considerable pains, the Cathars were memorialized and celebrated as martyred religious rebels by a region of Southern France that eight centuries later still promotes itself under their name, Pays Cathar. But in recent weeks, a debate has erupted across this region in newspapers, tourism offices, and in research conferences following an academic exhibition that explored a more modern day heresy. The Cathars never existed. People imagine that these people died as heroes in defense of their faith and against corrupt powers, said Alyssa Trivlion, a history professor at Paul Valéry University in Montpellier, who organized the exhibit. They feel a very idea of going back to investigate this painful story is unbearable. Trivlion is one of a growing number of early modern Europe scholars who have cast doubt on the Cather's existence, and her role as organizer of the exhibit has made her a target of critics who call her a negationist. Along with other maverick historians, she is dismissed as an upstart just trying to generate buzz and further her career. The thing is, I'll admit that the Cathars, generally speaking, have been painted in an incredibly flattering light throughout most of my sources. I'm not saying that they deserve to be wiped out or burned to death and no one deserves that, but they are without a doubt depicted as completely innocent martyrs that were just minding their own business. They might have been, they sure seem to be, but I know that history does get rewritten from time to time. Now this historian has argued that French scholars posed the question that medieval heresy may have been at the times invented as opposed to discovered. Perhaps medieval doctrine deviance has been exaggerated by scholars and that's a possibility, but I'm not sure as I go so far to discount the Cathars entirely. 
She claims that it was not doctrinal deviance that spurred on these Cather Crusades, but social and political issues instead. Now, I could be wrong, but is there really much of a difference between the three when we're speaking about it in terms of medieval times? As we said, in this century, the church and the state were very much the same. Social and political issues were closely related to Catholicism. So is it not possible that she is correct and the other historians are also correct? I could be misinterpreting her words, and so I just want to put the possibility out there. But anyway, the LA Times article continues explaining the following. More appealing today, however, is the idea that Cathars mounted the first major rebellion against the Catholic Church. They saw Rome as corrupt, rejected the church's hierarchy, and did not build cathedrals, but rather worshiped outdoors. This lack of structure gave women more prominence and freedom, and because they were pacifists who repudiated all killing, they were vegetarians. Myths are the very foundation of a social group or of a civilization, and sometimes indispensable cement of societies. The myth of the Cathars is even stronger because it allows people to identify with the vanquished of history. Now, personally, I'm in the camp where I'm more inclined to believe that the Cathars and their beliefs did exist, at least to some extent. Although I can understand a revisionist approach that Dr. Rebecca Riss speaks to as well. She explains that from the 1950s onward, revisionist historians have begun to question the accuracy of their depiction of Cathar practices and theology. After all, their beliefs were derived almost entirely from controversial sources written by the clergy, those who could read and write in medieval Europe. Simply put, the clerics could write down what they disagreed with in the Catholic doctrine and explain all these beliefs, the dualism, the reincarnation, all of that. However, the common man, those who couldn't read and write, may not have actually been as outspokenly against the church as we believe. In the 1987 book, The Formation of Persecuting Society, Robert Moore argues that heretical Cathars are nothing more than scattered dissidents and the church at that time would manufacture their significance. Other sources like scholar Mark Pegg claimed that there was no Cather hearsay whatsoever. Even so, a lot more debate about Cathars has been sparked in recent years, and I find it fascinating and at the same time sort of alarming. Alfred Rosenberg, for example, is one intellectual that spoke on them, a Nazi intellectual, as in yes, he worked for Hitler. And yet in his book, The Myth of the 20th Century, he speaks quite highly of Cathars and writes. The history of the Cathars, as well as the martyrs of free inquiry and the heroes of Nordic philosophy draws an impressive picture of a gigantic contest for character values. Those prerequisites of soul and spirit without the assertion of which there could have been neither European nor national culture. I've gotta say, it's an incredibly odd thing to read that phrase, which calls Cathars heroes and martyrs, knowing that the man who wrote it was a Nazi advocating for the genocide of Jews and anyone who didn't really like Hitler, basically. Like, he knows the people he's praising were victims of oppression too, right? Like just, it's an incredibly weird mindset to have. But uh, Cathars or not, I don't think either one of these options really make the Catholic Church of the early 1200s look any better here, just for the record. I can't say for sure if it was just a few clergymen that exaggerated the beliefs of Cathars, if the term Cathars was just used generally speaking about Catholics that they saw as heretics or how large or significant this movement truly was. I mean, if historians can't even agree, then I doubt I'll be getting to the bottom of this today. However, whether or not Cathars as a specific growing religion existed, those that opposed the Catholic Church most definitely did exist. Rebecca Rist, I believe, sums it up quite nicely and writes, in conclusion, I would argue that contemporary sources, whatever their limitations, failings, subtext, projections, and biases, can and do help us build up a picture of Cathars and their beliefs. One way to learn more about what the church taught them is to examine what clerical sources themselves say about heresy and heretics, as well as the decrees of Lateran III and Lateran IV, the two great numerical councils of the late 12th and early 13th centuries, and the correspondence of medieval popes. Such primary sources are not necessarily the best place to find information on specific beliefs and practices, and the historian needs to look elsewhere to other types of sources to gain a more rounded picture of the Cathars. It is always a shame that we do not have more evidence from the perspective of those accused of heresy. Nevertheless, papal documents are particularly important primary sources for the study of the Cathars because they tell us so much about the official view of the medieval church as dictated from its spiritual center, Rome. The Southern French tourism industry can breathe easy. The Cathars did exist.
So with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of Prism of the Past. Normally I do have something more conclusive when I end these episodes. I have a, this is what happened, here's the lineup, but the end of this is really quite interesting to me. It's something that I've spent many times thinking and reading about and never truly finding an answer. And I figured this would be something for a few of you to at least think over a little bit as well. Did the Cathars actually exist? I'm obviously in the camp that I think they did exist just because of just the volatility and the anger and the vitriol from the Catholic church. I mean, even involving a whole crusade to wipe them out. But again, that is my opinion. And that is where today's episode ends. Just a little food for thought. Did this happen? And did it happen to this extreme if it did? So thank you all for making it to another Prism of the Past. I appreciate you being here and I'll see you on the next one. Bye.